I am Christian Grönros. This talk is part of a series of lectures on service management principles. Now today the theme is value creation and co-creation and their marketing implications. It means we're going into the service perspective and some of the key concepts there. Uh, in the service perspective, value creation is uh, considered a very basic concept. It's said that, that uh, the service perspective of marketing is a, a perspective on value creation. At the same time, uh, for, for the past uh, 15 years or so, there's been a growing number of articles in the marketing area that will shift the focus of marketing and shift it towards value creation, stating that the goal of marketing is to create value for the customer. And of course, in return, create value for the firm, uh, what is often called capture value. This is nothing new actually in marketing because already in the 1950s, Roe Alderson uh, wrote about this and said that uh, what we really need to develop is understanding of uh, marketing's influence on value. But then this was uh, forgotten for a number of decades, but now has been again uh, emphasized quite a lot. So let's look into this. First of all, what is really the role of service in the marketplace? Now, if you look at this from the customer's point of view, we could say that the role of service is to support the customer. And that means that there is only service on the marketplace, meaning there are those who need support by somebody who has the resources and knowledge and network connections to be able to sort, support, support them and their processes, practices, activities. And then there are those who have these uh, resources available. And when these meet, service is provided to those who require support. And uh, the definition of service as a perspective is to facilitate and support someone's practices in a way that contributes to this person's or organization's value creation. And uh, doing so in a way which of course means value capture for the supplier or the fir firm as well. And uh, this being a definition of service as a perspective, there really is only service in the marketplace. But from the consumer's point of view, there is either good service or mediocre service or lousy service. But whatever we buy and whatever we use, we use as service because we put it into a usage process. I mean, that is service. And it either functions well or not. And service is uh, uh, how the firm will present and deliver uh, a core service or a physical product to the customer and how it will support this core service or product with, for the customer, necessary additional activities, like deliveries, like uh, repair, like maintenance, like call center support, like uh, understandable uh, invoices, like taking care of problems with quality or with service, what's called service recovery and so on and so forth. So in the marketplace, there is only service. If we look at it from a service perspective point of view. And then arises the question, what, what's needed then to support customers' practices as service. And uh, the important thing is to realize that the type of resources provided to customers is not important. Any firm can be a service business. It can be physical products, it can be service activities, it can be information that is in the core of the offering. But it, it becomes a service when it is, as I said, presented, delivered and supported in a way that really facilitates and supports the customer's practices and processes, activities in a way that contributes to their value creation. And this takes, of course, actions from the firm. The first is a strategic decision. Becoming a service business, adopting a service perspective is a strategic choice that any firm can do. But secondly, it requires a certain culture in the firm, a service supporting culture uh, service culture as it often is called. And without this culture in the firm, it's very difficult, 
not say impossible to uh, implement a service perspective. Now, let's go to value then as the very key concept in this service perspective. Now, from the customer's perspective, value can be described in a very simple way. And that is that uh, customers or any users feel better off when they become or being supported by a given firm. If, if the user, the customer, feels better off when they have bought something by a firm or an organization and use it and find out that, yes, I feel better off. Or that it also has been um, described in the literature, my well-being has improved. Then there is value. And of course, this is not a very theoretical definition of value, and that's not the meaning. The meaning is just to describe what value means from the consumer. There's a lot of literature on how to understand value and uh, how consumers understand value and perceive value. And of course, when we go deeper into a, a uh, situation and want to really understand how do consumers perceive value, we need to make use of all that literature. But here, for understanding the service perspective and its implications for marketing, it, it's enough to, to, to understand that value for a customer means that the customer feels better off when having used whatever he or she or the organization or any firm has required. Now, this goes the other way as well. The supplier, the firm, becomes a user when the customer will tell the firm that if you'd change your process of invoicing, so that we would have, uh, uh, it would make it easier for us to understand the invoice and process the invoice in our processes, that would make us better off. And this is information for the firm about how to improve their processes of, in this case, invoicing, which then makes the customer a service provider and the firm becomes the user. So this is a reciprocal situation. And it certainly is often like this, that service relates very much to a relationship situation. Because service means that two parties, uh, one way or the other, meet and interact. And that uh, makes it possible to create uh, a relational situation where both parties can gain. Now, how do we measure being better off? Without going into any details, uh, sometimes it can be measured in monetary terms. In business-to-business -business context, it's, uh, ca it can often be measured in, in effects on the cost level uh, for the customer, for example, or in effects on the revenue generation possibilities for the customer and in that way measured in monetary terms. But very often it can only be measured as a perception, a feeling that this really is better, a feeling um, that I really can trust this supplier, or a feeling of that it's a good idea to commit oneself to this supplier. So, so the perception is awful, often the way um, being better off can be uh, understood and, and, and even to some extent measured. But of course, whenever it can be measured in monetary terms as well, it should be measured like that. Then arises the question, how is value perceived by the user? And it's important there to, 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 to realize that usage is also a, a, a concept that is rather complicated. It's not like consumption in economic theory, which means that when we get a resource, we start to destroy the value of the resource through consumption, and when we destroy all the value, we got the utility out of it, and there's nothing less than the result. For example, buying a chocolate bar and eating it. We destroy the chocolate bar, but we get the value out of it, the feeling we feel better or we have more energy or whatever we're looking for. That's the traditional view of looking at consumption. Now, from a marketing point of view, adopting a service perspective, this doesn't work, because uh, usage, which is a synonym to consumption in, in, in a context like this, is much more complicated. And as you can, you can see, usage uh, is at least of four different types. 
You can talk about the physical usage, which is the normal physical consumption, which I just described with the chocolate bar example. But it can also be mental using, thinking of something. We're going to go to a nice place for Christmas, and we have already uh, arranged everything for that, and we're thinking about how we are going to spend Christmas, and uh, that this will be something that we, we, we're going to feel good about. Now that's mental usage already. Consumption has already started of uh, whatever we are then using uh, during Christmas, the Christmas activities. And then there's um, virtual usage, dreaming or something. Now this may relate to the same uh, process. After Christmas, we're back again and we're just thinking about what a great time we spent. And well, we, were, we went somewhere with a great hotel, for example, a fantastic food, a fantastic company. We're dreaming about what already happened. That's also part of usage. And value is there created as well, because we feel that, yes, this really was good. And, and in this way, usage is a very, very complicated, yes, fairly elusive process that can be very long, start long before the real physical consumption starts and continue long after the physical consumption starts. For example, we've been on a tour during our summer break somewhere and we come back home and year after we're looking at photos from that trip and we're dreaming of the trip. Virtual usage is still consumption and value is added to our previous experience in this way. So consumption as usage is a process that is totally different from the traditional consumption process. And then, of course, there is a fourth possibility as well. We own something, possessive usage. We own a piece of art, for example. Once in a while, we go and take a look at it and feel good about it, having this in our home, for example, this nice thing. And we feel good about that. Possessive usage also creates value. We feel better off when we have this piece of art hanging on a wall at home as compared to not having it there, for example. And of course, we feel good when we can show it off to, to friends and others say, look at what I bought, look at this nice piece of art here. So possessive usage is also part of usage. And we have to take into account all these possibilities when we are thinking about how is value created by customers, by users, where is it created? And of course, this is interesting from a managerial point of view, because when we then are responsible for an organization, for a firm, and how it should get customers, keep customers, and grow these customers, we have to think about how can we support these customers' perception of value out of what we are now offering them. And this perception of value can come out of physical usage, mental usage, virtual usage, or possessive usage. But becoming better off, that is, get value, uh, is not as sim simplistic as it uh, looks when we read the literature. Because we do not always create value as users. So we have to look at this a little bit more carefully. In principle, there are at least two ways in which value can uh, uh, become something that we feel that we've gotten out of usage. We can uh, either really create value instrumentally. We know, we know logically that by doing this, we become better off. We, because we do this, let's go to the chocolate bar. Because I now break the chocolate bar, I put it in the mouth, I eat it, I feel good about it, and I also know I will have more energy for, for the work in the afternoon, at least for the first hour, if I eat the whole chocolate bar. We instrumentally create value. But very often, probably this is the normal case, value just emerges for us without we realizing how did it happen? What did we do? We don't do anything deliberately which we register in our mind, but we, we just uh, live our life. 
we just use something, consume something, and well, at some point we start to feel, yes, this, this is good. I mean, going back to, to the Christmas again, we're spending Christmas with family uh, at a uh, resort hotel someplace. Well, we're just we're eating, we're uh, drinking, we're uh, singing, we're uh, sharing Christmas gifts. We don't deliberately think about when now opening this gift, I'm going to get value out of this opening process and what's in there. I just do it and I suddenly realize, hey, I got this very nice, interesting book which I always wanted to have, but I have, haven't had time to buy it. Now I can read it. Hey, this was good. And all of a sudden, value has emerged for us without being logically, mentally created by us. It just emerges. So we have to realize this as well. Uh, value is not something that we always instrumentally create. And this is from a managerial point of view and a marketing point of view important to understand that uh, value can become something for customers in different ways. Now, in the literature, it's, it's, it's to 99% said that value is created. I am going to talk about create value here too. But when saying create value, um, we mean that value either is instrumentally created by the user or just emerges for the user during the usage process. Or so, so it can mean either thing, although the, the normal expression is customers create value, and this is good to, to remember. Now, the, the important thing here also is, is to, to, to remember the flip side of all this. Value is not always a positive thing. It may very well be when I open the Christmas present and realize, hey, I got this book already. And then I kind of feel negative about this. But this person wanted to give me something other nice, but then I have it, it isn't good. What do I do now? Value is distracted by this part of the usage process. So value can also be negative. This is not in the traditional value theories where utility always is something that is positive and more and more. But from a service perspective point of view and from a marketing point of view, following a service perspective, we must also realize that customers also can perceive negative value. And in a relational situation where we have an ongoing contact with a user, a customer, there may be negative turns, but we should always be able to then for example, recover a problem, which has been a negative value um, perception by the customer, and recover the situation and make the process become positive again and, and uh, make sure the customers get positive value uh, experiences. So this is also something that's very little in the literature that value can be destroyed as well, but we must remember that this is also a case. Now, Let's then look at the two major value concepts that, that is, is used in the literature today, value in use and value in exchange. Value in exchange being the traditional one used in management theory and economics, and value in use, which is the, well, the very traditional one in economics, but really was something used way back in, in economic theory, more than value exchange as well and which now has become something of uh, importance as a key value concept. And what's really, what, 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 the, what do these two concepts mean and what's the difference between them? Because they are very different. So let's take a look at value in use first. Now, value in use is then the value emerging for or created by a user during usage as a utility. And in economic theory, it's said that value in use is based on utility theory meaning that it's the utility that em emerges for or is created by the customer during consumption or usage. And uh, another important thing is value in use evolves over time. It's something that uh, uh, unfolds during usage. And it's not there at any given point in town. This is value in use. But it is something that is changing all the time and 
possibly from the suppliers, the firm's point of view, hopefully from the, uh, from the supplier's point of view, it should be improving value creation all the time without destructive elements. So value in use doesn't exist at any given point of time. It changes all the time. It accumulates, but may take negative turns as well. It evolves. Now, value in exchange is totally different. Value in exchange as a concept is determined by the price paid by a user at a given point of time. So because of this, we often say that value in exchange is embedded in the resource, in the physical product or in the core service, that the value is already there. And in, in economic theory, uh, it's based on what's called labor theory, meaning that the firm or a, a chain of firms are working on various resources, people, raw material, raw material information, and so forth, using labor. And in the end, a physical product is the output. Could be a core service, but normally in the theory, talk, they talk about physical product. That's the output. And this output as such doesn't have value embedded in itself yet. But when the customer comes and pays money for it, then we realize that this was the value in exchange embedded in the product. Now, the difference between value in use and value in exchange is really dramatic because value in exchange exists at the given point of time, purchase. When the customer buys, then the value is there. And it doesn't change after that according to value and exchange. That's what it is. And um, traditional marketing models are based on this idea that uh, there's a value in the product. We make a value proposition, meaning we offer this to the customers, telling that this is the good it will going to do for you. And you can buy it at this price. And then we as marketers assume that this value will not change during usage, which of course is uh, a false assumption. It probably will change. But uh, that's how the marketing models are, are, are developed and what they're based on. And not only marketing models, management models, economic theory models, based on value in exchange today, largely. So the difference is huge. Let's look at it in another way, to try to, to illustrate it. If this um, line on the slide here is a labor process. And added to that is then the consumer sphere with usage. So there's design, development, manufacturing, and delivery of a physical product. Or if we do to talk about a, a service, there's back office activities when we prepare the resources and then the front office activities, the interactive part where uh, the customer meets the resources of the service firm, the customer gets involved in the service process. So in the back office, as uh, the supporting part and the uh, possible total invisible part of, of, of the service uh, organization. Now then, after that comes the customer sphere, which at this point, customer somewhere here buys the service and uh, starts using it. Now value and exchange is uh, created through work in the supplier sphere and ex exists here when the output of the process exists. Value in exchange at a given point of time. Now value in use is created here in the customer sphere. When the customer is using resources. Now there may be of course overlaps here. For example, front office of course and usage, delivery of product and usage, repair of product and usage. And that brings in the idea of co-creation which I'll uh, come to uh, later. But for now, let's keep these two spheres apart, the supplier sphere and the customer sphere. So we can see that value and exchange is created in the supplier sphere and exists here at a given point of time, the point of purchase, when and if the customer is prepared to pay money for it. Whereas value in use is created during usage in the customer sphere. And it doesn't exist at a given point of time. It evolves, it accumulates positively, can take negative terms as well, kind of negative accumulation if that can exist. Uh, it, and, and, uh, and therefore, its value in use is evolving over time. 
So they're two, two totally different value concepts that cannot be mixed, really. We shouldn't bring them into the same theory because we're talking about so different value concepts. Now, let's then look at co-creation and uh, value co-creation and bring in also this uh, situation where the usage fair and the supplier's fair are overlapping to, to some extent. Now, there are in the literature di two different approaches uh, to the service perspective. There's a dominating one called service dominant logic, and then there's a critical one called service logic, sometimes critical service logic. And um, to make my point clear, I think that from a managerial point of view, the critical service logic has more uh, to offer. Whereas from a more general aggregate point of view, what can service offer the society, the service dominant logic has more to offer. Now let's look at these two approaches. Let's start with service logic. The, the, the starting point is to analyze the service perspective on a managerial level, to see what does it mean to apply and adopt a service perspective in a firm. What does it mean for management? What does it mean for the business? What does it mean for marketing? Secondly, it treats co-creation as an analytically defined concept. There's a clear definition, what is co-creation? When does it take place? And thirdly, it defines the roles of the actors in the process. What is the supplier doing? What's the firm doing? What is the user doing? What's the customer doing? And uh, if we broaden the, 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 the model and bring in other actors and create a network, what are other network partners doing? I will not go into a network situation here, though. And finally, we must admit that, that service logic cannot uh, be applied on a higher level abstraction. And uh, that's really because we are looking at a one given firm customer situation and say, hey, how can we understand the service perspective in action there? And it's impossible to add these up into an aggregate level. We have to take another approach. Value in use, for example, cannot be aggregated. Because value and use means that we can measure the value experienced, either emerging or created by the customer, by each and every customer in the market, and add them up to an aggregate level, which is impossible. So we have to turn to an, uh, a shortcut to that. In economic theory, the shortcut was value and exchange, by the way. And uh, that's a, a similar type of shortcut have to be used you know, for the service perspective on aggregate level as well. Let's look at service dominant logic. It mainly analyzes service influence in the society on a high level of abstraction. And um, going to co-creation, it treats co-creation as a metaphor. It says that the firm and the customer always co-create value. And uh, that is a metaphor. It doesn't mean that the firm and the customer always co-create value, really. We are not there together and do it together, which co-create uh, linguistically correctly uh, means. It just means that we, the firm and the customer, are there in a long process uh, of value generation or whatever we call it, that in the end uh, we do different things but these are not defined and in the end this would lead to value emerging for or created by uh, the customer. And uh, there's no defined roles in the process for, for the actors, for the firm and the customer. Moreover, it becomes an inside-out management approach because the service dominant logic has this starting point that the customer is allowed to come into the service provider's value creation process and co-create value with the firm, with the service provider, which means that the service provider still drives value creation. So it's from inside out, whereas service logic takes an outside in approach, which I'll uh, demonstrate uh, later why it is like that. And the final thing, when service dominant logic is applied on a managerial level, it easily leads to what I would call goods logic influenced conclusions. For example, for marketing, the conclusion that the firm can only make value propositions, I I I which, which is one of the key um, 
propositions or premises of the service dominant logic is a good logic influenced a conclusion. Because what that says is that the firm can only suggest this is value and then we're just there and can't influence the customer's value fulfillment at all. And this is totally contrary to the interactions that occur, or to, the, to, to the fact that interactions occur between the firm and the customers. Where, as I will show you uh, shortly, the two parties or many parties involved, the firm and the customer, uh, indeed can influence each other and influence each other's value uh, perception and the value fulfillment for both parties. So this is how I see the differences between service logic and service dominant logic. Service dominant logic functions well to explain the service perspective on a high level abstraction, the importance of service for the society, for example, whereas service logic functions uh, for uh, explaining how the service perspective can be adopted on a managerial level. Now, going a little bit further in this, what about the, the value, value creation and, and value creation process aspects of, of, of these logics? The key value concept is value in use. Value in use is used by, by, by both these approaches to the service perspective as the key concept, value in use. Value is created uh, by the customer during usage and determined by the customer during usage. So let's look a little bit deeper into this. In service logic, it said that the user is the value creator. The user is the only value creator because if value in use is the value concept, value is created during usage. That's where utility emerges or is created. Hence, the one who creates the utility is the value creator, that is the user, a customer or anyone else could also be the firm in a reciprocal situation. And therefore value creation is defined in service logic as the user's creation of value in use. The user's creation of value in use. And mind you, I say creation of value in use, remember value is not always instrumentally created, it just emerges during usage for the user, as I uh, explained earlier. And finally, the value creation process is defined as the user's value creating process. Value creation is when the user creates value of use. When the user creates value in use, that is the value creation process. That's a, that, uh, how, how these concepts are defined in, in service logic. Service dominant logics, again, well, they say that all actors contributing to value for the customer in the end are value creators. S and um, what value creation is, is not strictly defined. It's not defined when it starts, when it ends, what's included, what's excluded from value creation. And th the reason is guy, because that's based on this metaphor of everybody co-creates value, which uh, uh, is like the metaphor he fought as a lion, which often mentioned in dictionaries, by the way, uh, when metaphors are described, doesn't mean that this person, he, is a lion. It just means that he behaves in a way, in, fight, in a fight, that uh, could resemble how a lion will be aggressive and, and like that. So it's a metaphor. And therefore, of course, it's very difficult, if not so impossible, to, 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 to define clearly what, what is value creation. And um, the value creation process is therefore treated as an all-encompassing process, including everything. Starting sometimes, ending sometimes, but there's no clear limits to, to what's included and what's ex ex excluded. So here again we can see a clear difference between the service logic approach to understanding a service perspective on marketing and business and the service dominant logic way of, of, of uh, looking at it. So if comparing the value creation process in, in these two approaches, it would be like this. This is how service dominant logic or SDLs looking at it, value creation is an all encompassing process, includes everything in the supplier sphere and the customer sphere. And if we add other actors in a network, everybody in this networking sphere, everyone there would be involved. Whereas service logic will define cre uh, value creation as uh, something that goes on in the customer sphere creation of value in use. So, so you can see it's uh, fairly different approaches to 
how to understand the basic concepts of value and value creation and value process. Uh, and these concepts are basic for understanding the service perspective and its uh, implications uh, on marketing. A little bit more about uh, what differs these two perspectives in, in uh, relation to, to value. That's the question, who determines that there is value in uh, what is used? And which are the actor's value concepts? What's the concept used by the user, consumer, and what is the value concept uh, used by the supplier, the firm? Not deliberately used, of course, but which is behind the analytical understanding of how value is used by these two actors. Now, both perspectives, service logic and service dominant logic, state that the user determines value as value in use. It's the user who decides is there value or not, and how much value is there. It's the user who decides that, so there's no difference there. But then comes the difference when we look at what value concepts are used. So here we have the value concept, the user's concept, the service provider's concept, and if you look at service logic, Value in use is the user's concept in the model. And if you look at service provider's concept, it's also value in use. In uh, just one value concept, value in use, that is used. So whatever the user is doing is something that can be described as value in use, value emerging or created during usage by the user. And whatever in service logic is, is said about how value is value creation is influenced by, by the service provider, it's again value related to value in use, created by the user, emerging for the user during usage. Now in SDL, service dominant logic, the user's concept is the same, value in use. Yes, value in use is how the user determines value. However, when it comes to the service provider concept, the literature doesn't give any clear indication of what's the concept really used. Uh, it's it's uh, sometimes value in use, but it can't be value in use because value in use in service dominant logic is uh, related to, to the customer's sphere. Uh, sometimes value in exchange is used in, in models explained uh, in, in, in service dominant logic literature, but you can't bring in value exchange in the same theory or model uh, that where we have value in use because they are so conflicting concepts and conflicting ways of looking at what value is, how it emerges and so forth. So there is an open spot there in service dominant logic. What is really the value concept used in, in, uh, um, in, 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 in this approach to service perspective uh, in the service provider sphere? And uh, in my view, this isn't a big problem when we lift all this up and look at it on an aggregate level, the impact of service for the society, then, then we, we have to to think in, in, in terms where we are not restricted to, to, to how one given actor, a customer, a firm thinks. When we look at this from a managerial point of view, we must be very strict so we know what is the value concept that we are working with. And that the supplier, the service provider, and the customer user uh, are uh, thinking about, or rather that we use the same value concept when describing what is the service provider doing in the process and what is the user, the consumer, doing in, in the process. So, a little bit further into value creation and the logic here, and uh, ask the question, which then are the roles of the two actors in a simple situation when we have a service provider and a customer and not a network? What's, what's the roles of the actors according to the critical service logic view of uh, the service perspective. So let's go back to the same illustration of the process, the supplier sphere uh, with the various activities there and the customer sphere with usage. And um, what we know now is that at the point of purchase there is expected value in use for everyone. There's no value in exchange when the customer buys according to service logic because that's not the value of importance here. That's kind of a sub-value exchange. Of course, the customers pay a price, and that's nice to know. They want to pay this much and not this much. 
but it really is not a valid value concept yet because value is something that emerges only when customer realizes this really makes sense to have bought this resource. I can use it in a way that creates value, in a way where value emerges for me. So we, we, service logic says that there's expected value in use at this point. Doesn't bring the value and exchange concept at all into the, to the, to the perspective and, 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 and the related model. And the, the service uh, generation process or service um, evolving process or whatever we call it, it would be like this. During the, the activities by the supplier, in the supplier's fair potential value is accruing during various activities that are taken care of uh, by, by the supplier. In, 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 in various activities in the manufacturer, design, develop, manufacture, delivery, and a lot of other activities, of course, uh, or in a back office or front office, uh, uh, if we use terminology often used uh, in, in, in service context. Front office, the interactive part of the service organization, and, and back office, the supporting and, and totally invisible part of it. And this is how the process unfolds. And in the end, after the customer then has bought and is, has used or is using the resource or resources, value for the customer is accumulating as value in use. It evolves over time and may take negative destructive turns as well, but it, it evolves over time, it accumulates. Accumulation is not the best word, of course, here, because accumulation gives the impression always better, but th we must remember the possibility of negative turns as well in this value accumulation process. So the conclusions are, Potential value that customers pay money for is a function of expected value in use. It's not a function of any value in exchange. It's, it's we have to keep it in the value in use mode. And actually, if we go back to, to, to uh, uh, value theory in the area of philosophy, Aristotle already said this, that uh, the value that there is when buying products or services is a function of what is the utility that the user is going to perceive when later on using this product or service. So we have all, all this in, 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 in um, philosophy. Older. And as far as I understand, Plato, who was half a generation older than Aristotle 2,000 to 300 years ago, also made the same point. So it's nothing new under the sun here. Uh, but uh, it's how marketing and business and management based on the service logic now is looking at, at uh, value and the relationship between value in use and what is the firm or a, or a, or a supplier doing when preparing for this. Now let's look at something else and the model gets a little bit more complicated. Like the illustration gets complicated, it isn't complicated. What about value co-creation then? Now this is the same illustration, but for some reason I, 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 I've um, drawn it a little bit different. Here we have the same process, the customer fair usage, the firm's fair, the, the, the uh, creation of potential value and use. But then there is a part where these two meet, where these two interact, the two spheres, the customer's fair and the uh, um, customers fair. And of course here in the end value in use accumulates over time is a process of value fulfillment as, as we said here. But when these two spheres uh, interact then we come to something that we can call a value or rather more generally co-creation platform where the creation of value in use may take place. A co-creation of value in use may take place on this co-creation platform where the supplier sphere and the customer sphere meet, are intertwined, where the two parties interact. Now, um, why is it like this? Well, let's go up here in the model. According to service logic, this is customer's creation of value. It starts when the customer sphere starts, like this. 
there's the customer's fare, but part of the customer's fare becomes a joint fare, joint with the supplier because they interact. And here we have the provider's fare, and part of it becomes a joint fare, the same part, when the supplier and the firm interact. And um, to add to the figure a little bit more, at this point, where the, where the interactions start, the customer has bought the offering and, the, and decided that this potential value in use that exists now as an output is an acceptable promise about value, often called value proposition. That is accepted. And before that, well, it's what you call resource compilation. The service provider is compiling resources and uh, creating the service process. For example, how the restaurants should look, how the waiters and waitresses should behave, what should be on the menu, and uh, so on and so forth, to just take one example there. And when that has been done, here then customers join the restaurant and the interactions begin. And that's a co-creation platform there when co-creation of value and use exists. Now, when the interactions end, at some point the customer leaves the restaurant or any other service system, the customer still continues creating value or, emer or, or value still creating, uh, continues to emerge for, for the customer through these other types of uh, usage processes, dreaming about something, for example. And um, okay, then, then, then the customer is alone, partly. It's called customer's independent value creation. But then there's something that's been pointed out what was called customer dominant logic which is a, 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 an offspring from a service perspective, say at looking at what really is going on in the customer's processes. And they talk about the customer's ecosystem. The customer's ecosystem, meaning that we have friends, we have business associates, we are on various social media, and with all these people here, in various ways, face-to-face, -face or over the telephone, or over the social media, or just using SMS or, or SMS or anything like that. We interact with these people and there we may bring up our experiences and the creation of value continues in these interactions in the customer's ecosystem. And that has in, in uh, customer dominant logic be called uh, customer's social value creation. So it's another type of value co-creation here social value co-creation. But we don't co-create value with the firm, with the service provider, but with people in our ecosystem as customers. And it's a social value creation. Here it's real value creation. Here it's a social value creation. So this is the process. And this indicates where does co-creation take place according to service logic. Not everywhere. It's not co-creation when the service firm or any firm compiles resources. It's not co-creation when the customer independently uh, uh, feels better off in one way or the other, creates continuously var value. It's uh, something else. Co-creation is only when the firm and the customer meet in direct interactions. And then it's the social value creation, if it takes place in the customer's ecosystem, which is a totally different thing from this. And then one thing should be pointed out here. These processes of uh, resource compilation, co-creation, uh, independent customer creation, they do not have to follow each other as linearly as indicated here in, in, in this illustration. They can be iterative in various ways. For example, in a manufacturing situation, very often the customer is brought in in product development phases or in design phases, and even in manufacturing phases. In those situations, a co-creation platform is built and their value co-creation can already start. And the customer might start to feel, yes, this is going to be good because I'm involved now in designing this product. So value has already started to emerge for the, for, for the customer in that co-creational situation. So, so co-creation doesn't have to uh, be situated, of course, at one given point here on the timeline between uh, compilation of resources by the service provider and, and independent value creation. It, by the customer, it can be everywhere. But direct interaction is an important aspect here. Direct interaction is an important aspect here. So let's look at that. 
the nature of the co-creation platform. It relates to direct interactions. It's, uh, it's formed by direct interactions between the user, for example, a customer and the service provider, a service firm, a manufacturer, an organization, uh, any, 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 anyone. And when these direct inter interactions occur, there is this platform. Now, direct interactions means that we meet. We did either face by face, but we can also meet uh, mediated through a website, depending on whether the website talks back, which websites often do. So the concept of direct interaction is broadening. It gives new opportunities for the firm to interact with the customer and co-create value with the customer. If we can create intelligent websites or other intelligent systems that, that, that will react back when we as a customer do something. So it reacts back and tells us, for example, do better do that thing. So, okay, I'll do something else because you don't want it like, like we suggested in the beginning or anything like that. But in the simplest and normal situation in service context though, uh, although they become less normal, is uh, diets where people and you know, people together with systems and resources do meet face to face. And um, indirect interactions, well indirect interactions, that's situations where, where the resource doesn't act back. For example, a physical product, it, it works in one given way. I'm using here this uh, gadget with which I'm shifting slides. Now, when I push this button, it just does one thing, slides, next slide. And when I push this button, it goes back to the further slide, and I push this button, it just points out a place on the slide. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't interact with me, because it's silent. It acts just only one way. It's not intelligent. It doesn't learn from what I'm doing with that. So indirect interactions is not part of the co-creation platform. Now, then we have to look at the nature <coughs> of direct interactions. And I think this is one of the reasons why, why service dominant logic draws conclusions that I feel are, are, are good logic influence, that, that interaction seems to be more a afterthought or a consequence of, of, of the service perspective than a antecedent or a reason for it. And service logic says interaction is an antecedent of the service perspective. It has to be there in order to be able to, 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 to implement the service perspective. And according to service logic, direct interactions are formed by a process where the users and the service provider's resources merge into one process, which is interactive, collaborative, and dialogical. Think about this. Take the restaurant example again. I go to the restaurant and uh, we are a party of four. The restaurant is a good restaurant and they have a set menu and they have then uh, an, an, an uh, a la carte menu where you can choose freely what you want to begin with as main courses and so forth. And you find that, yes, it would be nice to have the set course. However, one in the party says, I don't like that dessert. And then looks at the menu and says, well, that's a good dessert. And then ask the waiter, could I have this set menu, but could I change the dessert to this one? Now the waiter will listen, will think, and react back, and either say yes, of course, or say no, the kitchen doesn't like it, or, or say anything else. And then uh, the person in my party will say, well, why is that? I mean, you have all these ingredients, you, you, you could freely change this. And then the waiter or waitress will start, yes, but you know, it's not uh, our policy, or something like that. And, and this continues. Now those two processes, the service provider process executed by the waiter or waitress and the customer uh, usage process executed by my fellow party member here, they just have merged into one dialogical collaborative process that either leads to the customer being better off, the waiter concludes, yes, of course, or the customer feels worse off, the waiter says it's impossible. Well, let's hope there comes some recovery after that, so my friend in the party will start feeling better off again uh, uh, after that. So you see, it's always like this in direct interaction. The processes have the potential to merge into one process. One process. 
But it's not two processes anymore. It's, it's just one process. So service providers value facilitation process. The service provider suggests value by we doing it this way. We offer these uh, parts of, of, or, or these uh, items uh, in the set menu. And, and the customer or accept this or want some changes in the usage process. They just merge the value facilitation process by the service provider and the value creation process by the customer merge into one process. So that's what it is. So from here we can draw some conclusions about the roles in the creation of value for customers of the actors involved. The ground rule is, according to service logic, that the customer creates value as value in use and the firm facilitates value in use. The firm facilitates customers' value creation. The firm is providing resources, compiled resources of various sorts, including processes, physical resources, service activities, information, whatever is required, in a way uh, that will be perceived by the customer as something that can be used in a value-creating way, or then not. So the firm facilitates the customer's value creator, but the customer is the one who creates value. So we can draw three conclusions further from this about the roles. The customer is always the value creator when value is defined as value in use. The firm is fundamentally a value facilitator. The fundamental worm of a firm, a service provider, is to compile resources and present them in a way that enables value creation by the customer during usage in the customer's value creation process. But during direct interactions, when a platform of co-creation is formed, the firm can co-create value together with its customers. The firm can. I mean, it's very possible that the firm doesn't manage to make use of the platform. In the restaurant's example, if the waiter or waitress just doesn't know what to do and just comes to the conclusion, no, we can't do anything about the set menu, it's there or not, well, then the platform is not used for supporting the customer's value creation. And the, the outcome will be negative value destruction. So it can be used or then it's not used. And uh, the second thing, even more important perhaps is this, a firm can co-create value together with its customers. Not as in service dominant logic, the customer can co-create value with the firm. It's the firm who can co-create value with the customer. The customer is the driver of the value creation process, not the firm. And this makes the uh, service logic uh, an outside-in management approach, or it enables outside-in uh, management. Finally, about co-creation, before a few words about marketing. Reciprocal value creation opportunities occur, as I said before. Because on every co-creation platform, the two actors meet, and uh, through direct interactions, the value facilitation can go both ways. So the platform looks like this, it's written, uh, illustrated in an even more sim simple way, the firm the customer, and here's co-creation activities where they meet. So it can go this way, the firm as service provider, and the customer is the user. So the here the firm provides the service, the customer uses on this platform, the firm can influence customer's value creation. And then the other way around, for example, the customer will say, if you do it in some other way, it will be even better. The customer is the service provider, and the firm is the user. So this is possible to go that it goes both ways, and the firm must know how to make use about the information and other inputs that the customer is giving for free, by the way, on the platform during these co-creations, value co-creation situations. And if the firm doesn't know how to use it, then it doesn't work. There are implications of the direct interactions that are important now to keep in mind. And the most important perhaps are those for marketing here. But before going to that, let's let look at it uh, from a interaction 
production point of view and interaction value creation point of view again. Now, here on this in this illustration, we have production, the resource compilation here, and value creation by the customer here, and here's the interactions in the middle. Now, we can look at the effects of the direct interactions uh, from the production point of view and from a value creation point of view. Now, this is more a summary of what's uh, been discussed by me so far. From a production point of view, we have in the direct interactions join, the joint production. The customer participates as co-producer with the provider. It's the service provider, the firm who drives the production process, who drives the service process, who sets the stage there, not the customer. So the customer is joining as a, as a production co-producer. And that's, of course, been in the service marketing literature in the 1970s. From a value creation process, it's the other way around. And that is, the provider participates as co-creator of value with the customer. The joint value creation process. The provider participates as a co-creator of value with the customer. It's the customer who drives the value creation process based on the value in use concept as the key value concept and the only value concept used in, in critical service logic. And it may be that it, this that has uh, created this mix, um, this mixing up of this in, 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 in other approaches to the service perspective where, where it said that, that the customer is, is invited to co-create value with the firm where the firm is driving the co-creation process. They actually talk about production and not value creation. That is possible, but it's not clearly uh, spelled out that way in, 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 in the literature. But now marketing, the third implication now are direct interactions. Implications for marketing. So same illustration, service provider sphere called production of service process and customer sphere, the customer's value creation, and the joint sphere interactions here. From a marketing perspective, well, the important thing here is that during direct interactions on the platform of co-creation, the service provider may influence the customer's willingness to continue doing business with the provider, influence the customer's preferences towards the provider, willingness for the customers to continue being a customer, meaning the firm can influence the customers to grow the relationship with the customer, which marketing these days is ultimately aiming at, keeping the customer, growing the customer. Because on, on the interaction, on the, uh, on the co-creation platform, during direct interactions, what the firm does is actively and directly influencing the customer's value fulfillment, the value creation process, by listening, by responding in this interactive dialogical process. Remember my restaurant example. And uh, um, by doing so, the customer may feel that, yes, I'm more better off. They really understand me. They're really helpful. I really think I should commit myself to this a little bit more, to this restaurant. I think I'll come back again when there is a need to go to a restaurant like this, or I need a need for me to take out the party like the one I have now. It's a marketing effect. It makes keeping the customer, it grows the customer. So the direct inter interactions are very important for understanding marketing uh, based on a service perspective. So a conclusion here is that we can go beyond making value propositions only. Remember, value proposition is what the marketer suggests to the customer. This is the offering. This is what we think it can do for you. This is what it will cost for you. That's the price or any variety of these things. That's the value proposition. And that's what we can do based on a goods logic. That's the only thing a goods producing firm can do. When you buy this product, you will get this. And then we hope that the customer can use it and will feel that, yes, it supports my, my practice of whatever I'm doing where I need this product. Uh, so 
the conclusion is that based on a service logic, the service provider can move beyond making value propositions and through interactive marketing influence the customer's value fulfillment, the val customer's value creation process, and also therefore influence the customer's future buying and consumption behavior. Through interactive marketing that can take place during this, uh, th these direct interactions, the firm can go beyond just making the proposition. They can just go in and influence how the pro proposition is perceived by the customer and how it works and make changes if we want to correct things that doesn't really fit what the customer in the end uh, would like to have and would like the, the offering to, to, to function and so forth. And this is nothing new. It's been in the, in the literature in the, no, on service marketing since the 1970s. So going to, to a final conclusion, the marketing game plan. Looking like this, we have the firm with the marketing department and so-called full-time marketers. We have the customer uh, who is buying and using and creating value for themselves. And we have the offering. The offering with uh, a core as a physical product or a service activity or information or anything and then extending as much as we want so that it becomes a service provided to, to, the, to the customers. Now, on this side, the firm customer, we have the traditional marketing that creates expectations, uh, makes value propositions. Now, well then we have the, the um, second side here, between customer and offering. We have then provided an offering, and then the offering should keep the promises. Now, in a service context, the offering includes a number of direct interactions, and uh, that all uh, it works in a way that should help and support customers' value fulfillment by meeting expectations through the service process. What we are doing and how we're handling the process in interactions with the customers is what we're talking about. That's, what's called, that's what interactive marketing is all about. And uh, there we have part-time marketers, as Professor Evert Gummerson from Stockholm Uni University has suggested, part-time marketers, everyone who's not full-time marketer in the marketing department, but influences the customer's willingness to buy again, is a part-time marketer. And then on the third side, we have the process of enabling promises, and th that is done through uh, internal marketing, through the development of uh, systems and other resources, which makes it possible to enable value propositions and makes it possible to enable value fulfillment keeping the promises. And this is how marketing functions in a service context for a service business. And it's important to realize the service business doesn't have to be a service firm, like a bank or a restaurant or a consultancy firm. It can be any firm that chooses to take a marketing uh, approach to uh, its customers based on a service perspective, adopt a service logic. Thank you.